So we are slowly working our way through the infectious cycle. And we have two more lectures today and next time. We'll be finished with looking at how viruses go through this, and then we'll move into issues about disease and infection of hosts. Today we're going to talk about something we've been working towards for a long time, and that is the synthesis of proteins. And remember, we classified all of our seven different genome types of viruses according to the pathway to mRNA. We put mRNA in the middle because no virus has its own translation system, and it must make mRNA that can be read by host ribosome. So today we're going to look at this process of protein synthesis. And we'll, have a, we'll start with just an overview of the process in eukaryotic cells. And then we'll talk about the different tricks that viruses use to get their proteins efficiently and preferentially translated. So even though viral mRNAs are translated by the eukaryotic translation apparatus, viruses can modify it in various ways. So that's one of the things we're going to look at today. The first uh, issue we have to address is the structure of this mRNA that's been in the center of our Baltimore scheme for many weeks now. And of course, uh, on the upper right is the general structure of a eukaryotic mRNA. And it has a five prime cap. It has a five prime untranslated region, which doesn't encode protein, which is shown here as UTR. On, on the three prime end, there's also an untranslated region. There's an open reading frame, beginning with a start codon and ending with a stop codon that encodes a protein. And this mRNA is polyadenylated. We've encountered the cap before when we talked about transcription. Uh, we talked about how this is an unusual linkage of the first base to the second by a five to five prime linkage rather than a five to three prime linkage, which occurs in the rest of the nu nucleic acid. And in addition, we talked about how the first and second bases are also methylated. This is part of the cap structure. Now, these caps are found on most uh, mRNAs in eukaryotic cells. There are some exceptions. For example, mitochondrial uh, mRNAs are not capped. And certain viral RNAs, as you will see today, are not capped. Yet the cap is very important for a number of processes. Uh, it's important for processing of mRNA. It's important for transport of mRNA out of the nucleus. It regulates uh, degradation of the mRNA. And as we'll see today, a cap is needed for efficient translation by a mechanism called 5 prime end dependent mechanism. So we're, already we see some virus mRNAs do not have caps. So right away, we have to figure out how to get efficient translation uh, in the absence of a cap. So let's take a closer look at this mRNA, this general mRNA structure for a eukaryotic mRNA. Again, uh, a 5 prime untranslated region. This is typically 50 to 70 nucleotides, but sometimes it can be very longer. And one of the functions of this is to regulate the efficiency of translation. If it has a lot of secondary structure, then it will impede ribosomes from moving through it, and it will reduce the translational efficiency of the mRNA. And so this makes sense because if you need not much of a given protein, you can structure the 5 prime UTR so that it's inefficiently translated. And conversely, if you need a lot of a protein, you can keep the U meaning evolution has made it so the 5 prime UTR doesn't have a lot of secondary structure. And as we'll see, when there is secondary structure, the ribosome employs a helicase, an enzyme that unwinds the secondary structure so it can move through this region. 3 prime untranslated region can also regulate translational efficiency and mRNA stability, and the poly A tail is important for efficient translation. And as we'll see, it's also involved in circularization of mRNAs. But notice there is one open reading frame in this messenger RNA. This is a limitation of the eukaryotic translation apparatus. We'll talk about towards the end of today. And it's something that viral genomes need to get around. And one of the topics will be how they do that. The translational machinery in brief, consists of uh, ribosomes. Uh, these are RNA protein complexes. They're protein synthesizing machines. In eukaryotes, they consist of 40S and 60S subunits. And when they join together, 
uh, they form the turkey shown at the top, and that is where proteins are made. These are, these are composed of RNAs and proteins. You can see uh, for the 40S subunit and 18S ribosomal RNA and about 30 proteins, a larger RNA, three RNAs actually for the 60S subunit and more proteins. It's actually the RNA that carries out the catalytic function of the ribosome. You can, you can actually take the protein away and the RNA alone will still catalyze protein synthesis. And we think this is because it's a relic of the RNA world. It was first RNA and then ribos proteins arose and ribosomes uh, and that's the RNA was, was already able to do catalytic functions. Uh, in addition to the ribosome, we have transfer RNAs, of course, which uh, read the codon on the mRNA and put the right tRNA in. And then we have a lot of other proteins involved. They're called initiation proteins or EIFs, elongation proteins, EEFs, and termination proteins, ERFs. So we divide translation into three distinct phases just so that we can study it better, initiation, elongation, and termination. So let's look at how mRNAs are translated in, a, in an uninfected eukaryotic cell. This is called 5' end dependent initiation. Many viral mRNAs will be translated by this process as well. Now, and this depends on having a 5' end that has a cap on it. And what happens is the 40S subunits uh, are, are free of the uh, larger subunit in the cell, and they're bound to a couple of initiation proteins, particular EIF3. Uh, they then bind what we call the ternary complex, which consists of a couple of initiation proteins and the MET tRNA. That's the initiator tRNA because we think the AUG codon is the initiating codon and the methionine is put in in response to that. Uh, this binds to the 40S subunit, which then engages a larger protein called EIF4G, which is shown here in red. And then uh, 4G, is this whole complex, consisting of the 40S subunit and 4G is brought to the mRNA uh, via interactions of the cap with what's called a cap binding protein, EIF4E. So EIF4E binds the cap and it binds EIF4G, so it brings the whole complex to the mRNA. And that's what we call the initiation complex. Years ago, they used to study it by sucrose gradient, so it's called a 48S initiation complex. So again, this is what the cap is needed for to bring the ribosome, the 40S subunit, uh, to the mRNA. Let's take a look a little more closely at this protein EIF4G, which is red in the previous slide and in this one as well. A, a line diagram of the protein is shown on top. It's rather large. 220,000 Daltons, and it has many motifs within it for binding to other proteins. And if we look at the way 4G interacts in 5' end dependent initiation, the middle panel, we've taken away a lot of the initiation proteins and we've taken away the ternary complex so you can see some of these interactions a little better. You can see uh, how the 40S subunit is bound to EIF3, EIF3 in turn is bound to 4G, 4G binds to EIF4E, and 4E binds to the cap. So a series of protein-protein interactions and eventually a protein-cap interaction as well. So all these interactions with 4G with 3, with 4E are all diagrammed on the line uh, image above. Uh, in addition, there's EIF4A binding site. EIF4A is an RNA helicase that unwinds any secondary structures that the ribosome will encounter. Now, as you'll see, and in fact you have seen already when we talked about RNA synthesis, not all viral mRNAs have a cap. The coronaviruses, for example, don't have caps, and many plant viral RNAs don't have caps. Uh, many of them have VPG at the 5' prime end, as is shown here. Uh, and there, there are multiple ways to attract the initiation machinery if you don't have a cap in viral mRNAs, and one of them is shown here. VPG actually binds EIF4E. So it takes the place of the cap and recruits 4E, which then can re recruit the rest uh, of the initiation complex. So that's one way to get translated if you don't have a cap. We'll see another way in a few moments. <clears throat> now, we have learned in the last 10 years or so that translation probably doesn't just occur in a linear molecule as we always draw them in these diagrams but probably some kind of circularized mRNA. We call this juxtaposition of the ends, 
And on the top is one way that this happens in eukaryotic cells, and there's ample evidence for this. Um, poly A binding protein, PABP, which is the blue protein in the top panel here, this of course binds the three prime poly A. It's been known to exist in cells for many years. But not too long ago, it was shown that PABP can also bind EIF4G. So there's another binding activity of 4G besides all the others. It can bind poly A binding protein. And that effectively brings the ends of the mRNA together because 4G is bound at the 5 prime end, PABP is bound at the 3 prime end. And in fact, the results of genetic analysis and biochemical analysis show that if you don't have this circularization, you get much less efficient translation. So we think that's because ribosomes initiate at the 5 prime end and they translate the protein and then instead of falling off, they can just recircularize and go around to the 5 prime end again. So this happens in both uninfected cells and virus-infected cells for, for viral genomes that are capped. And a couple of plant viruses, now in the plant virus world, they name them according to the disease that the virus causes. So here we have P. ination mosaic virus and barley yellow dwarf virus. Really colorful naming, almost as good as the genes uh, in Drosophila. So here we have a plant virus RNA where um, the circularization is achieved in a different way. Here, the initiation complex, the 40S EIF3, 4G, EIF4A, actually binds to the three prime end of the mRNA. And that's, that makes no sense at all, right? Because the initiation codon is at the five prime end. But what happens is there's a long range RNA, RNA interaction. There are two stem loops, one at the five prime end, one at the three prime end they can base pair, and that brings the initiation complex to the five prime end where it starts translating. So it's a really unusual way of doing business, but that's the plant viruses for you. I hope I don't offend any plant virologists who might be listening. All right, so back to our initiation scheme. We've got an initiation complex at the five prime end, and now the ribosome has to move to the initiator AUG codon, all right? And again, as I said before, if there's some secondary structure in the five prime untranslated region, which is schematized here as a stem loop, the EIF4A helicase will unwind it, unless it's too strong. If it's a certain strength of, of secondary structure, the helicase can't deal with it, and that mRNA will not be translated. Now, how this complex moves down is, is really not known, because obviously it can't move. It's anchored to the cap by, by the cap binding protein. So either that comes apart at some point, or maybe the uh, mRNA is actually pulled through this complex, bringing the AUG codon to the 40S subunit. Uh, either way, eventually the, uh, the, this initiation complex, remember, has a ternary complex in it, which has the MET initiator tRNA, and that is looking for the AUG codon. Eventually it will find it, and when it does, a lot of things happen. There's hydrolysis of, of the GD, GTP molecule to GDP. There's release of all these initiation proteins. And the big subunit comes in and joins the 40S. So now we're ready to make proteins. We have a uh, ADS ribosome sitting right at the initiator codon. Right, so that's the process of eukaryotic translation in a nutshell. We went through it very quickly. But the main points are the cap is really important for this. And EIF4G plays a role in doing that, and we're gonna look at how viruses can modulate this uh, later on. All right, so we have a question which says, which statement about the five prime cap on mRNA is wrong, is incorrect? It consists of M7G joined to the second nucleotide of mRNA by an unusual five prime, five prime phosphodiester linkage. It is present on most cellular mRNAs. It is required for efficient translation by five prime end dependent initiation. It binds the cap binding protein for EIF4E, uh, and it is found on mRNA, but not pre-mRNA. Okay, well, half of you got the right answer. Uh, it, it, the statement it is found on mRNA, but not pre-mRNA is incorrect. Uh, the cap is added very early on in the transcription process. So it's on pre-mRNA uh, as well as uh, mRNA. Okay, so when all the splicing happens, the cap is already there. Uh, a lot of you pick the others, but they're all right. It is linked by a five to five prime linkage. 20% of you said it is required 
<laughs> for efficient translation, you say that that was wrong, but that's in fact correct. That is one of the main functions of the CAP to be uh, in, to allow efficient translation by five prime and dependent initiation. So I suspect that you forgot that uh, caps are added at the very beginning of transcription. All right, so we've talked about now five prime end dependent initiation. There's some other ways that we have discovered of initiating in virus infected cells. So they take the basic translational machinery and they modify it to suit their genomes. And let's, let's look at two ways or three ways that this happens. So here's an experiment uh, which demonstrates an unusual initiation process called ribosome shunting. All right, we have three mRNAs here on the left, uh, wild type mRNA and then two mRNAs with a stem loop structure at different places. And we take these mRNAs and we put them in a cell-free extract so that they can be translated and then we run the proteins on a gel which is shown on the right. So the uh, open reading frame on this mRNA when translated gives rise to two proteins. So you see you take the wild type uh, mRNA which is capped, it's got a little bit of secondary structure uh, and it can be translated very well. So this secondary structure is not an impediment to the ribosome because that helicase activity you can get through it. Uh, now we put a three prime insertion here, a very stable stem loop structure. It's known that negative 80 kilocalories per mole, that's a measure of the stability of the stem loop. This is, this is going to block a ribosome, but look it doesn't. The three prime insertion allows translation and when people found this out they were really uh, amazed. If you put an insertion of the same type at the five prime end, you see you don't get any protein synthesis. So apparently this first insertion near the five prime end can stop the transit of ribosomes, but something else is going on downstream from that. This five prime non-coding region happens to be from a adenovirus mRNA, which was discovered early on to be translated in an unusual way. And these experiments revealed this mechanism of ribosome shunting. Basically what's happening is the ribosomes bind, bind to the cap just like we talked about. They start scanning and in the wild type sequence they then leap over all of this secondary structure and land at the AUG. And so if you put a stem loop near the five prime end you block scanning but the one at the three prime end doesn't matter because the ribosome is jumping over it anyway. So what does this mean jumping over it? Here's what we think is happening. We have uh, this mRNA now shown with 40S subunits. Um, the, uh, the 40S can scan over secondary structure that's not too strong. Uh, and then it gets to a certain point and this intervening RNA is highly structured so that the movement of the 40S brings it right to the AUG. It's, it's folded in a way that would put this AUG right next to the stem loop for example. So the ribosome doesn't actually have to scan through the RNA, it can just move across the top of it. So that's the shunting mechanism. It's been found in a number of uh, viral mRNAs. And so basically this is getting around having secondary structure. And so you don't need a lot of helicase activity in order for ribosomes to move over this structured RNA because they are leaping. And so the requirement for the helicase is less and there's less of a requirement for binding to the cap as a consequence because that binding recruits the helicase. So that's one unusual mechanism of initiation, ribosome shunting. We'll come back to that a little bit later. The other one is, is epitomized by coronavirus genomes like poliovirus. Uh, when these genomes were sequenced many years ago, it was found that the AUG codon, which is shown uh, on the upper left, was 740 bases away from the five prime end of the message. And this was a long five prime UTR for those days. Plus there were lots of AUGs uh, and termination codons within this sequence. And, and finally the RNA, which is diagrammed here in green, had a protein instead of a cap at the five prime end. And people just could not understand how this protein could be translated. First, not having a cap, and second, by having such a long UTR full of AUGs. I mean, weren't the ribosomes going to get fooled by them and never make it to the right AUG? So a number of experiments were done to elucidate how initiation happens, and it revealed a brand new mechanism of initiation. And the experiments are shown here. Uh, what was done was to make two uh, mRNAs, 
by recombinant DNA methodologies. And the one on the left, they both have two open reading frames on one mRNA. Now, in eukaryotic cells, as you'll see, this is very unusual. Eukaryotic mRNAs typically just have a single open reading frame because that's all the ribosomes can handle. If you take this mRNA, which is capped, the ribosomes will engage the cap and scan through the first open reading frame. You'll get a protein made, but most of the ribosomes will fall off after the termination codon is reached and never make it to the second open reading frame. Between these two open reading frames, there's a little spacer region. So you, you get very little of the second open reading frame translated. A few ribosomes are wayward and they keep going, but most of them fall off. And this is typical of eukaryotic messages. Now, if you take the five prime untranslated region of polio, which was on the previous slide, 742 bases, and you stick it in between these two open reading frames, now both proteins are translated with equal efficiency. And the idea was that somehow this region, which turns out to be highly structured, as you can see by the green lines, is attracting the ribosomes internally without the need for a cap at the five prime end. And this was called an internal ribosome entry site or an iris. Now, a lot of people didn't believe this and that's okay to be skeptical because it makes people get more data in support of your idea. So another experiment was done and that's shown at the bottom here. They did the same experiment as the top, take these two mRNAs and translate them in cells, except the cells on the bottom were infected with poliovirus. And we know, as you will see very, at the very end of today's talk, uh, that poliovirus shuts down the ability of ribosomes to bind the five prime cap. All right, so there's no five prime end dependent initiation in a poliovirus infected cell. So the mRNA on the left, no proteins are made in a polio infected cell but the mRNA in the right, you had the second open reading frame translated very efficiently. And that ruled out the possibility that ribosomes were simply binding to the five prime end and scanning very efficiently through this structure. So that's what the pundit said, ah, the iris, it's not an iris, it just allows ribosomes to transit more efficiently. Well, that can't be the case because uh, you don't get anything made if you block initiation at the five prime end, okay? Which, which is what happens here. So this is a ribosome entry site. It's, it's since been found in all the picornaviruses, many other viruses as well. And if you want to make two proteins on one mRNA, say you, you are doing some protein production experiments and you want to make two proteins from one mRNA, you put an iris in between them. You can buy these, they're commercially available and they're commonly used to make multiple proteins from a single uh, mRNA. Now, there were still skeptics, many skeptics, in fact, who didn't believe this. So a third, another experiment was done years later, which follows on the prediction that an iris doesn't need a five prime end, right? It doesn't need a cap. The ribosomes bind internally. Therefore, if you could circularize the RNA, it should still be translated as long as there's an iris. So it took a long time for people to figure out how to circularize RNAs, but they did. And here they're shown two, one with an iris, and one without, and they both have open reading frames. And if you put these in cells, only the circular RNA with the iris is translated into a protein because the ribosomes can bind internally on the iris. They cannot translate the circle on the left because it doesn't have an iris and there's no free five prime end. So let's put the pundits to, to rest after this one. Now, how do these work, these irises? turns out that there are different classes of irises. You can't actually look at a sequence of an iris and say, aha, this is an iris, because there's no conserved elements or very few conserved elements. What, what is really important is the secondary structure. And you can classify these into four or five different classes based on the secondary structure. And they're shown here, type one, two, three, four, and five. And they come from different viruses. For example, polio iris is on the upper left. Uh, the encephalomyocarditis iris, which is another picornavirus, is the one that you will get if you buy a cloning vector with an iris in it, because this iris works in many different cell types, and it's very efficient. But you can see here that uh, they're all highly structured, and that is how they work. The RNA structure attracts proteins of the initiation pathway and eventually the ribosome. So for example, on the EMCV iris in the middle, uh, that little area which is encircled, that's where EIF4G binds directly. It doesn't need to be recruited through EIF4E binding to a cap. It can actually bind the RNA directly. And many of these others, in fact, se several of these other irises can bind the 40S subunit without any 
proteins uh, in addition. So that's how they work. And, and that, that function is, is illustrated in this slide. So at the top, we have our model for 5 prime end dependent initiation, again, where the 4G and the ribosome is brought to the mRNA by interaction with a cap binding protein. We've talked about that. That kind of initiation, you need all the initiation factors, in addition to these shown here, many others as well. Now in the middle is the way we think the type 1 or 2 iris works, the polio or EMCV iris. And we think the 4G molecule interacts directly with the RNA. And of course, EIF3 is bound to 4G. And that brings the ribosome to the RNA. You don't need a cap to recruit the 40S subunit because you have direct 4G RNA interaction. Uh, this also requires a lot of initiation factors, but it doesn't require EIF. 4E, the cap binding protein, because there's no cap on the mRNA. Now, you may be wondering why the end of this 4G is broken. Well, that in fact is what poliovirus infection does to 4G. It cuts off the end terminus, so it cannot bind 4E, and that shuts off translation in the cell. We'll look at that later on. Uh, finally, there is a very interesting iris from hepatitis C virus. This is a Flavi virus, a different family where the iris, which is shown here as a structured RNA, actually can bind the 40S subunit directly. It doesn't need any intermediaries. It doesn't need EIF4G or EIF3 to bind. Now, it will require 3 and EIF2 to translate the mRNA, but only two initiation proteins are needed to start that complex. So that's a very interesting iris. We think it's ancient and was probably around in some form uh, during or shortly after the RNA world because it can interact with ribosomes which arose early on. Next question, what do ribosome shunting and internal ribosome initiation have in common? Cap recruitment of the 40S subunit, both involve RNA secondary structures. Ribosome scanning through the entire 5' UTR, both require cap binding protein 4E, or all of the above. All right, 75% of you got the right answer, which is both involve RNA secondary structures. Um, the iris does not involve cap recruitment, so that's not right. Scanning through the entire 5' UTR, neither uh, way of initiating involves scanning. The, ribos the iris, the ribosome binds somewhere internally. And remember, the shunting, the ribosome hops over much of the RNA, and cap binding protein is needed for, for the ribosome shunting, but not for iris dependent initiation. We have placed by various mechanisms, 5' end dependent or internal initiation or ribosome shunting, we have placed the ribosome, uh, the, the whole ribosome, the ADS, at the initiation codon, which is shown here as an AUG. And the MAT tRNA is in place at the peptidyl site. So the ribosome has three defined sites where things happen. The peptidyl site, the P site, the E, which is the exit site. Once the tRNA, once the, the amino acid has been linked to the growing protein, that tRNA moves into the exit site, then it falls away. And then the next tRNA comes to the A, or the amino acyl site. It comes in, a bond, a peptide bond is formed, and then the mRNA, the ribosome shifts down. So let's look at some uh, virus-specific permutations of this. We have been raised to believe that all initiation is methionine-dependent. When you get biology in high school, and possibly even here, you're probably taught that the methionine codon is the initiator. And in fact, it's not always the case. Some viruses initiate at other than methionine codons. And here's an example of that. This is a virus called cricket paralysis virus. It is the polio of crickets. It was first discovered in Australia when farmers went out in the morning and saw crickets lying paralyzed in their fields. And a virus was isolated from them. And it's actually being used for cricket controls in some places. Anyway, someone sequenced the genome and found that there are two irises in this genome. Most picornaviruses have a long, single open reading frame. And there's an iris at the 5 prime end. But here you see there's a second iris. So there are two open reading frames. And these viruses have been moved out of the Pocorna virus family into their own dicystroviridae, two cistrons. Uh, 
Anyway, this second iris is really interesting because uh, the, the ribosome can bind it directly. And that's because the viral RNA shown here in green, this is the internal region, it mimics a tRNA. It folds and it looks just like a tRNA. So the ribosome binds it, yes. Yes, viruses usually have one. This is an exception. Right. And this is also interesting because the internal iris has this unusual way of mimicking a tRNA, and therefore it's sitting at the P site, at the methionine codon. So the, f the first amino acid to be added is actually the next one, which is a, in this case an alanine. So this is alanine dependent initiation. And the first codon isn't even a methionine, it's a proline. That's what's matching up to the uh, tRNA-like structure. So if you sequence a genome and look for protein coding regions just by looking for methionines, you could be underestimating the number of proteins. It's difficult to, to figure out which ones would be methionine independent, unfortunately. And so no one really knows in our genome what fraction of methionine independent proteins there are. I think you would have to do proteomic analysis on the whole proteome to, to learn that. Anyway, this is a really interesting um, example of methionine independent initiation. Now, your question was, do viruses usually have one iris? And, and the answer is mostly, but why can't they have more than one, right? Like this. We don't see this uh, very, very often in viral genomes. And it would be a nice way to get multiple proteins from a single mRNA, but we don't see it. And I don't know the reason for that. All right, there's another cool example of this. Uh, in a plant virus, turnip yellow mosaic virus. Again, it's methionine independent initiation, but this time the tRNA is a structure forming at the three prime end of the, M, of the viral RNA, okay? And this is, actually, this is actually charged with valine, this tRNA-like structure on the viral RNA. It's part of the RNA itself. It's charged with valine. It sits, so the RNA loops around. This sits uh, on the uh, initiation site, which uh, is a GUG in this case, close to an AUG, and the protein begins with a valine, and then the next amino acid is inserted as well. So again, two cases where the viral RNAs are mimicking tRNAs. We've sort of alluded to this idea of one mRNA, one protein. So let's look at this in some detail. Um, and here on this slide, we see at the top a eukaryotic mRNA. We call these monocystronic. They have one open reading frame. A cistron is an old word for a, a genetic unit which happens to be an open reading frame. And you see one protein encoded per mRNA. This is generally the case in our mRNAs. Now, of course, you can get splicing uh, to make different RNAs from a precursor, but typically uh, one gene, uh, one protein is the rule. But in bacteria, the mRNAs can be polycystronic can have one mRNA, and from it, multiple proteins are made. Eukaryotes, one mRNA, one protein. You can have multiple spliced mRNAs from a gene, but one mRNA gives rise to one protein. Now in bacteria, we know that there are sequences around the AUG that can actually <laughs> recruit the ribosome. These are the so-called Schein-Delgarno sequences. They're complementary, they're sequences in the mRNA that are complementary to uh, ribosomal RNA, and that's how the ribosome finds this initiator codon. But we don't have those on eukaryotic mRNAs. And so we only have one open reading frame per mRNA. Now this is a limitation for a virus. Think of a virus with an RNA genome, especially a virus where the genome is mRNA. How do you get multiple proteins? Because most of the viruses we talk about, we need to make more than one protein <coughs> to replicate the genome, to make uh, capsids and so forth. So I want to look at the next few slides at some of the solutions that have arisen uh, among viruses to get around this one mRNA, one protein rule. Some of these that were discovered in viruses turn out to also exist in eukaryotic cells. So even though most of our genes, most of our mRNAs encode one protein, there are a handful where these viral strategies are also used to get more than one. So here are the, all, the, all the solutions I know of for getting around the one mRNA, one protein limitation. And I call this maximizing coding capacity of the viral genome. Because you think of it, poliovirus has a genome which is an mRNA. You can't just make one protein from that. You have to figure out how to make more. And that's what we're talking about here. 
And we're not going to talk about all of these today, but some of them you already know. Uh, we're going to pick a few and, and highlight them, but they include making a polyprotein, which we'll talk about, uh, making subgenomic mRNAs, uh, VSV, for example, a negative strand um, virus makes multiple subgenomic mRNAs. So that's a way to get, it's a really simple way to get multiple proteins from one RNA. You simply make multiple RNAs. You could have a segmented genome like real viruses or influenza virus. Each segment could encode a protein. So you get around that by putting pieces into the virus uh, particle. RNA splicing, of course, can give you multiple proteins from a single gene. Internal initiation, we've seen an example of that with cricket paralysis virus where you could get at least two proteins by doing, putting in an extra iris. We'll talk about leaky scanning. Uh, there's also a, a process called reinitiation where a ribosome will stop and start again and make two separate proteins. We won't be talking about that. Suppression of termination we will talk about and ribosomal frame shifting. So lots of amazing strategies all discovered in viruses for getting around the one mRNA, one protein rule. So polyprotein synthesis, we've seen this before in the coronaviruses at the top and the flaviviruses at the bottom. And this means that you have a plus-stranded RNA in the virus particle, which is translated when it gets into the cell. And these, these viruses in these two families typically encode one long protein, a polyprotein. And you may think, well, that doesn't make any sense because you can't get multiple proteins. Well, these genomes encode enzymes, proteases. Uh, and they're shown here in color in red and blue. They're called 2A and 3C for the picornaviruses. And these cut up that long polyprotein to give you a dozen or so proteins that you need. So these proteins, these proteases are embedded in the polyprotein and they're able to cut themselves out and then float around in the cell and cut uh, other bonds in the polyprotein. So on this top diagram, you can see the blue uh, arrowheads are cleavage sites for one of the two proteases. And the same strategy for flaviviruses, plus stranded genome, is translated into a long polyprotein. And then there are enzymes that cut to give you the final proteins. In the case of the flaviviruses, both a viral protease and a cellular protease is used to make these cleavages. There's no reason to restrict the processing to a viral enzyme. All right, polyprotein, brilliant strategy. You can get a dozen or so proteins this way from one mRNA. Leaky scanning, I find this one really interesting. So here at the top is an mRNA. This happens to be of a paramyxovirus, but it, you can imagine it might be VSV. So these are negative strand RNA genomes and multiple mRNAs are made from these genomes. And this is just one of the multiple mRNAs. Now you may think, you make five mRNAs, you make five proteins, but it turns out that leaky scanning allows you to make multiple proteins from one of these mRNAs. So here's how that works. On the top is the diagram of the open reading frame of this, of this mRNA. So there's an open reading frame at the top that encodes a P protein, and that's different from the C proteins, which are encoded in a different frame. Now on the bottom is an expansion of the five prime N. What happens is the ribosomes bind the cap at the five prime N, they start scanning. And the first initiating codon they reach is an ACG. Now, ACG can sometimes be used to add a methionine. It doesn't match up perfectly with AUG, but it will work. And so a fraction of the ribosomes initiate there, and they make this 215 amino acid C prime protein. But th this is a very inefficient initiator site, so most of the ribosomes keep moving, and they encounter the next AUG, which is at 104. And, and a fraction of them will translate that and make the P protein, which is an entirely different open reading frame from the C proteins. Um, but the AUG here is, is surrounded by what we call a poor context. So it's not only the AUG that's important for the ribosomes to select it, but surrounding sequences, there are good and bad sequences. And this AUG 104 has, has a poor context, as we say. So many of the ribosomes keep going, and then they finally reach AUG 114, which is a good context and so they all translate that, that, um, that protein. And these two proteins differ at their end termini and they can have different functions. And finally, there are two more proteins translated from downstream AUGs that are quite far away, and these are actually made by ribosome shunting. Uh, the ribosome, some of the ribosomes that initiate leap over all of these early regions and land at these two initiation codons. So this is using the cellular ribosomal apparatus. The virus has done nothing to modify it. Apparently, 
ribosomes can be tricked into doing these kinds of gymnastics on a viral mRNA to expand the coding capacity. Another way to get more proteins, and this is a very important one, is suppression of termination. So let's look at how protein synthesis stops. We haven't talked about that. Uh, when, after a while, when a ribosome has been translating on an mRNA shown here on the upper left, you have a growing polypeptide chain, which is diagrammed here. And then eventually you reach a termination codon. You know, there are three different termination codons available. One of them is UAA, which is shown here. And the termination codon is actually recognized by a protein, a termination protein called uh, ERF1. This is the purple blob here. And ERF1 looks just like a tRNA, except it's a protein. And it sits into the A site on the UAA, and it causes uh, termination of protein synthesis. It causes hydrolysis of the peptide from the last uh, tRNA, and the ribosomes then fall apart, and that's the end of the story. However, at a low frequency, these stop codons can be recognized by authentic charged tRNAs. They can be misread by a normal tRNA, one of the 20 or so amino acids uh, char uh, added to tRNAs, or sometimes they can be recognized by specific what we call suppressor tRNAs that actually recognize perfectly the suppressor codon. And an example of that would be selenocysteine, which, for which there are tRNAs that recognize the UGA termination codon. So this is not high frequency. This is maybe 5 to 10% of the time a protein is made. You may get suppression of termination. But for viruses, this can be very important. And let me show you uh, how that could work. So these are two examples now of, of the use of termination suppression on a viral genome to get more proteins. On the left is a retroviral mRNA. And we talked about this very briefly uh, last time. The retroviral genome encodes uh, GAG and Paul from a single mRNA, then the envelope uh, is encoded on a separate spliced mRNA. So here's the GAG Paul, but it turns out that GAG and Paul are separated by a stop codon. And that stop codon is shown right here, the UAG. You don't need much of Paul. This encodes reverse transcriptase, integrase, RNase-H. You don't need a lot of it. So 5 to 10% of the time that a ribosome goes across this region, the UAG is suppressed, and you get the synthesis of a, pre of a long polyprotein, gag Paul, which is then processed by a protease. So most of the time, you have just gag made, the structural protein, which you need a lot of to build capsids. 5 to 10% of the time, the ribosome actually hits this stem loop, which is, which is actually a pseudo-knot. It pauses just enough for a suppressor tRNA to come in and in certain amino acids, so protein synthesis continues. All right, so that's very important for retroviruses. Without the polymerase, they wouldn't be able to do reverse transcription, of course. On the right is a different kind of RNA virus. It's a plus-stranded RNA virus. And we talked about these. Uh, these are alpha viruses uh, where the, when this RNA comes into a cell, it's naked, of course, and it's translated uh, to, to form uh, proteins from the N-terminus. Uh, and, and these are precursors of the polymerase, actually. These NSP1, 2, 3, and 4, they join together to form the RNA polymerase. Uh, there happens to be a stop codon uh, right there shown in purple. So the initial protein that's made is only part of the polymerase. It doesn't include that last part, NSP4. And so you get some suppression about 5 to 10% of the time at that stop codon. You get a longer protein, which then gives you an active polymerase. Now, again, the idea being that you don't need a lot of this. It's an enzyme, so maybe suppression is enough to give you what you need. It's kind of regulation is the way I look at it. But you get more protein from the genome by using this approach. One more is very cool. It's called ribosomal frame shifting. And this also happens on some retroviral mRNAs. At the top is a retroviral mRNA. You have the GAG and the Paul regions. Now, in the previous example of suppression, I told you that there's a stop codon between the GAG and the Paul regions. In these, in these other retroviruses, they're different ones, the GAG and the Paul uh, open reading frames overlap, and the Paul is in the minus one open reading frame. So effectively, the ribosomes terminate at GAG, and that's the end of the story because Paul is in a different open reading frame. But a fraction of the time, <laughs> the ribosome uh, 
pauses, it backs up one and changes reading frame and continues, and then you make a fusion protein, which is shown on the bottom here. You make a Gagpol fusion, just as for translational suppression, which then can be cleaved to give you the individual proteins. So ribosomal frame shifting. This, Paul, is it a different reading frame, minus one? I'll show you that in a moment. Most of the time you get gag. About 10% of the time the ribosomes back up, change reading frame, and then you get the long protein. And this has since been found in uh, bacteria as well as eukaryotes to, uh, to operate. So here's a model for how that happens. So on the upper left we have the mRNA and the ribosome is busily making a protein. You can see uh, five amino acids are already there. And now there are these two unusual triplets. We call this a slippery sequence because frame shifting doesn't occur just anywhere. It only occurs at these slippery sequences that they've been caused. And, and you'll see why in a moment because it turns out that going back one will work. So here we have AAUUUA and the tRNAs are, are nicely base paired with those. Uh, then the ribosome slips back, or in this case the tRNA is slipping back. The ribosome has bumped into a secondary structure of some sort. So now the uh, tRNAs go back one base only. And you can see they, you know, there, there are mismatches, two out of three mismatches, but they can still remain attached to the mRNA. But now they're back one base. And that red, that, that yellow A, which was base paired in the first panel, is now exposed. So now you can have another tRNA uh, coming in on the fourth panel, and that's an isoleucine tRNA, which will base pair with the AUA, which the A is exposed now, so that can go in before it would have been a termination codon. UAG would have been a terminator. And so now the, the isoleucine, because of this minus one shift, is brought in, and you can continue the polypeptide. You make a fusion by this minus one frame shift. And so uh, that's how that works. And again, uh, the retroviruses and other eukaryotic genes do this to maximize coding potential. Okay, compared with a polycystronic mRNA, a monocystronic mRNA does not require an AUG start codon, does not bind the 40S ribosomal subunit, has only one open reading frame, is only found in viruses and bacteria, and all of the above. 96% got the right answer. My, a monocystronic has only one open reading frame. Some of you answered is, is only found in viruses and bacteria, and that's, that's not true. For the last part today, I want to talk about the regulation of translation, this process that we've been discussing, from the point of view of the virus and the cell, how the virus regulates it so that its mRNAs are translated more efficiently and, and the cellular mRNAs would be translated less efficiently, and how the cell tries to counter that. The, the cell finds a viral mRNA present and says, no, this is not happening, we're going to shut down translation. So that's what I mean by this. It's a two-sided war. Now, on the right, uh, are examples of regulation that occur at the three steps, initiation, elongation, and termination, and they're color-coded. So you can see the blue line, it's got a lot of different examples. You're not meant to see them. You're just meant to be impressed by how many there are at the, at the level of initiation. So initiation is a rate-limiting step for translation, and most of the regulation that we know of happens there. Not to say that elongation and termination don't have their mechanisms, so in other words, the ribosomes moving down the mRNA translating, the speed at which that happens can be regulated, the termination step can be regulated, but by far most of the regulation happens at initiation. And that's what we're going to talk about today. First one is just one example. I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. As you saw on that slide, there are too many. There's no point in us going through each one. The principle is what's important. And this is the way a cell would respond to virus infection and shut down protein synthesis to effectively eliminate the infection. And this brings us back to the initiation step of translation. Here on our cycle on this slide, we have a, a, a messenger RNA, a capped mRNA, and we've assembled the ternary complex right at the methionine. And remember, when the methionine initiation codon is found by the scanning ribosome, you have release of 
of uh, lots of initiation proteins, and the big subunit comes. But one of the things that happens is uh, this EIF2 GTP, which has been involved in bringing in the ternary complex to the initiator, the GTP is hydrolyzed, energy is released, which is needed for this process, uh, and then GDP is, is released bound to EIF2. Now, EIF2 eventually needs to uh, bind a new initiator tRNA, which is shown on the upper right, so it can go through this initiation cycle over and over again on new mRNAs. And in order for EIF2 to participate in that initiation again, the GDB has to be exchanged for GTP so that you have uh, energy again to do the initiation step. So there is a guanine exchange protein called EIF2B, which binds GT GDP EIF2. It then exchanges the GDP for a fresh GTP, and off EIF2 goes for another cycle of translation. Turns out that this is a very sensitive step for regulation. In cells, there are a number of protein kinases, and three of them are shown here, that phosphorylate a subunit of EIF2, that blue protein, called EIF2-alpha. So these are EIF2-alpha kinases. They put a phosphate on EIF2-alpha. And that's shown happening here. We're taking these kinases, of which there are three listed here, take ATP and transfer a phosphate to EIF2. Now when this EIF2 gets bound by EIF2B in an attempt to recycle out the GDP for GTP, it gets stuck there because of the phosphate. The phosphate uh, makes it impossible for the EIF2 GDP to get out. And in fact, it turns out that EIF2B is limiting in cells. So eventually you sequester all the EIF2B and there's no more recycling, so you have no more fresh EIF2 GTP and translation stops. So this is a cellular strategy to stop, to limit virus infection. It detects, the cell can detect the presence of virus infection by a way I'll tell you in a moment. And it shuts down translation with the idea being, all right, we'll sacrifice this infected cell and maybe we save the organism. Of course, viruses are not thinking this. This is simply the way that it's evolved. Now, the kinases that do that, three of them are, are shown here, um, and they respond to different things. They respond to uh, stress in the endoplasmic reticulum. And this kinase called PERC uh, will phosphorylate EIF2. And if you make a lot of viral glycoprotein in the ER, which is destined for transport to the plasma membrane, as we will see next time when we talk about assembly, that induces stress, and the cell says, crap, there's something not good here, we gotta stop protein synthesis uh, until the stress is gone, and, and this, this kinase phosphorylates EIF2. There's another kinase, GCN2, that responds to amino acid deprivation, and then finally there's a, a kinase called PKR that detects double-stranded RNA. And it turns out that this is made in, in many virus-infected cells, both RNA and DNA viruses. So it's a signature of virus infection. Typically, double-stranded RNA doesn't exist in the cell, in the uninfected cell. So this is a detector of virus infection. PKR is then activated and results in inhibition of translation. Now, uh, how is PKR activated by double-stranded RNA? In the middle, near the top, is shown an inactive molecule of PKR, which consists of a kinase domain, KD, and two double-stranded RNA binding domains. When viral infection ensues and double-stranded RNA is produced, you see there's a molecule of double-stranded RNA here. These uh, PKR molecules will bind uh, the double-stranded RNA by virtue of the double-stranded RNA binding motifs, as you can see in the middle. Multiple kinase proteins bind a single molecule of double-stranded RNA, as shown here, and they phosphorylate each other. And that activates them so they can go on then and phosphorylate EIF2-alpha. So the kinase, as it's produced by translation, is inactive. And it will only be activated when it sees double-stranded RNA produced by virus infection. And then EIF2 is phosphorylated and translation is shut down. Now it turns out that this protein, PKR, has a role in host cells as well that are not infected. There is a protein called PACT that will activate it and cause it to phosphorylate various targets. And this is thought to be important during development. This is actually a catalyst for apoptosis, programmed cell death. So when you are making certain lineages of cells and you need to get rid of them by apoptosis, 
PKR can function in, in that context in an uninfected cell. But what we're concerned about today is on the bottom, the activation by double-stranded RNA. This system is so powerful, it is so antiviral, that if a virus couldn't antagonize it, it would be done. It would be finished from the face of the Earth. So almost every viral genome we know of has some kind of antagonist of this pathway. And I want to share some of those with you. Just to summarize what I've said, uh, virus infection, as you'll see later on when we talk about interferons and innate immunity, virus infection activate, uh, induces PKR synthesis and then activates it by the mechanism we just talked about, double-stranded RNA. Host translation is inhibited. The cells undergo apoptosis. They die, and maybe that stops the virus infection. And as I've said, there are different viral mechanisms to inactivate this pathway. And almost every step, it's really remarkable. So here's just one example I'm going to show you in some detail. We have our PKR inactive. Uh, and this cell is infected by adenovirus. Uh, adenovirus makes double-stranded RNA because you get transcription of both DNA strands. And the two transcripts will come together and hybridize and make a double strand. And that double stranded RNA will activate PKR to get phosphorylation of EIF2. However, the virus encodes an RNA, which is made rather early in infection, called VARNA1. It's shown here in the upper left. It's a small RNA. It binds PKR with high affinity, but it only permits one PKR molecule to bind to it. You cannot get multiple PKRs bind as you get on double-stranded RNA. So that PKR bound to VARNA is never activated, and therefore there's no shutdown of host and viral translation. So the virus makes tons of this VARNA, and it sequesters uh, PKR, and that way the virus avoids this shutdown. Okay, so that's just one example of evading this PKR response. And there and every virus we look at, there, there are more examples. And the antagonism, so we call this countering inactivation of EIF2. And this image just shows you the different levels at which we can counter uh, the effects of PKR. So we talked about uh, the adenovirus VARNA, which is basically uh, an antagonist of RNA. It binds. Um, the PKR, so the PKR can't bind RNA. And you can see that there are other viral RNAs. The Epstein-Barr virus, Eber, is a short RNA that does a similar thing. Um, but there are other ways to interfere with PKR than by binding the RNA, and those are shown elsewhere. There are double-stranded RNA binding proteins encoded by viruses. They, they bind the RNA, prevent it from uh, activating the kinase domain, and they're antagonists of the protein itself. Uh, there are proteins that interfere with the activity of, of PKR. But there are also antagonisms at different levels. There are some viral proteins that mimic EIF2 and make PKR think that it's uh, binding to uh, uh, th this other protein, and, it, and instead EIF2 is not phosphorylated. So the viral protein is bound up by PKR instead of EIF2. Uh, then there are also antagonists of the kinases themselves. This happens to be the PERC kinase that detects stress in the ER, and they're viral antagonists as well. So at every step in this pathway, not just the PKR, but the kinases, EIF2 target, there are mechanisms that different viruses have evolved to employ to avoid translational shutoff. Because as I said, this is a very effective way to shut off translation. And the viruses would be dead in the water if they couldn't uh, antagonize this. All right, our last question. PKR is an interferon-induced enzyme that is activated by what leading to phosphorylation of what and inhibition of translation? All right, 80% of you said it's, uh, PKR is activated by double-stranded RNA leading to phosphorylation of EIF2-alpha. It is not, excuse me, it's not EIF2B that's phosphorylated. EIF2B is sequestered as a consequence of uh, phosphorylation of EIF2-alpha, but 2B is not itself uh, phosphorylated, and GDP is not the um, activator of uh, PKR. This is another host response to viral replication whose aim is to shut down translation so that viral replication is inhibited. We talked about phosphorylation of EIF2. 
And this is a different one. It's called formation of stress granules. Now these are relatively recently described structures in uh, cells, in eukaryotic cell cytoplasms. They can be, indu be induced by virus infection, but also by other stresses as well. But here we have a virus infected cell where uh, viral double-stranded RNA is sensed by PKR, for example, and that sends a signal to start building these stress granules. So uh, the way that happens is EIF2 is phosphorylated, translation is shut down, so then you have these mRNAs we call stalled. The ribosomes have stopped on them. There's no more initiation. And when that happens, the cell senses this somehow, we don't know how, and they shunt those into these stress granules. These are actually punctate structures in the cytoplasm that contain these stalled mRNAs. So they have a circularized mRNA with the five prime initiation complex on them. And uh, they've stalled at the initiation point because EIF2 uh, alpha is not available with GTP on it. These stress granules are made up of a number of different structural proteins. Uh, and they would effectively stop the virus infection. But as for PKR phosphorylation, there are ways of viral antagonism to get around this. And some of those are shown here. Uh, for example, <clears throat> one of the proteins that makes up the stress granule is called G3BP. It's a structural component. Uh, polio virus, one of the proteases cleaves it. So it prevents the assembly of stress granules. They cannot form in a polio infected cell because of the protease that's cleaving it. Uh, other components, so that little circle, the the red line circle shows, it means simply that the cleavage of G3BP prevents assembly of the stress granule. And other viruses do similar things. They sequester G3, G3BP, for example. These are the replication assemblies of hepatitis C virus. Remember, many RNA viruses replicate their genomes on membranous vesicles, and that's what we're showing here. In this case, they replicate on a lipid droplet. And these viruses actually pull G3BP into these replication complexes, and that prevents assembly of a stress granule. And other viruses do similar things to G3BP. They sequester them uh, either in initiation complexes or in other structures, replication complexes. And another structural component, TIA and TIAR, is also sequestered as well. The bottom line in here is that you don't need to know the names of these proteins. All you need to know is that one of the other responses of a cell to try and limit a virus infection is to sequester the viral uh, mRNAs in these stress granules where they can't be accessed by ribosomes. They're not translated, they're silent, but many viruses prevent them. Obviously, otherwise, they wouldn't be able to replicate. <clears throat> viruses do their own thing. They need to have the whole translation apparatus devoted to making proteins from their messenger RNAs. <clears throat> they don't want the cell making its own protein. That would be stealing amino acids and tRNAs and ribosomes, right? The virus, uh, for maximal efficiency, uh, has evolved to uh, turn off the host in many different ways, turn off host translation to get maximal translation of its own mRNA. So here's one example I'm going to show you. This is a cell infected with poliovirus. And on the left, um, we're looking at the rate of protein synthesis on the y-axis. And on the bottom is the time post-infection. So this is a very, very quickly developing infection. By two hours uh, after infection with poliovirus, host cell translation is essentially shut off. Uh, and then by three hours or so, it's replaced by virus protein synthesis. Whereas in an uninfected cell, the rate of synthesis is pretty much the same over the course of uh, four or five hours. And on the right is a protein gel to show you that in, in, uh, in a different way. Here, at different times after infection, we have labeled cell proteins with a little bit of S35 methionine, and we fractionated the proteins on a gel, and, and we can see the individual polypeptides. So at time zero, you have a schmear, basically. These are all cellular proteins, the, the hundreds and hundreds that are being made. And then you can see by three hours, the background of cell proteins is decreasing and it's slowly replaced by these distinct polypeptide bands, which are the viral proteins, the enzymes, the polymerase, and the structural proteins. So the virus has inhibited host translation and it's replaced it with its own. 
And so when this was discovered many, many years ago, people wanted to know how this worked because uh, it, it could represent a point of intervention, but also could illuminate how the cell is translating. And in fact, much of what I've told you today, the, fu the function of EIF4G, for example, in translation, was discovered because it's the target of inhibition in polio-infected cells. So here we go back to uh, EIF4G. Remember, it binds the cap uh, via EIF4E and then brings in the 4DS subunit via, EIF, by, by, via EIF3, which isn't shown here. In cells infected with a variety of viruses, including poliovirus and other picornaviruses, uh, these viruses make a protease. One of those two proteases that processes the viral polyprotein cleaves right at the end terminus of EIF4G. And that separates the binding site for EIF4E from the rest of the molecule. <clears throat> so this effectively shuts off host translation because the capped mRNAs can't be translated. So why do viral RNAs continue to be translated? They don't have a cap, remember. They have VPG at the 5 prime N. And they have an iris instead to recruit the ribosome by internal binding. So th these viruses have no need at all for EIF4E, so they don't <laughs> care that the 5 prime N, the, the end terminus of 4G is cut off. In fact, this cleaved remainder of 4G is perfectly functional to bind the iris and recruit the ribosome. So it's brilliant. These viruses have evolved to cleave 4G in just the right place, and they have an iris which allows translation uh, in the absence of EIF4E. Now there are other uh, means of regulating host translation which are shown here as well uh, and one of them involves uh, dephosphorylation of EIF4E. There's some uh, idea that phosphorylation of EIF4E is important for high affinity binding to the cap so some viruses uh, cause dephosphorylation and they are able to translate in a uh, mechanism that is relatively independent uh, of, the, of the 4E protein. And then finally, there's another mechanism shown here which involves a second protein called 4EBP1. 4EBP1 stands for 4E binding protein. It is a protein which can bind to 4E and sequester it away from translation initiation. When 4EBP1 is phosphorylated, it's inactive. But uh, infection by a number of viruses, including polio and EMCV, leads to dephosphorylation of 4EBP1. And now in that state, it is able to bind 4E. And of course, when 4E is bound to 4EBP1, it cannot recognize the cap. The cap binding area is sequestered by 4EBP. So it's another way of shutting off host translation. So on this slide, we have three mechanisms, cleavage of 4G, dephosphorylation of 4E, and a 4E binding protein. Now, this 4E binding protein has roles in uninfected cells as well. And there's a complex pathway that, that is involved in translational regulation. So essentially, the viruses have evolved to co-opt regulatory systems that are already present. Now, this is, these are just a few examples. But in almost every virus-infected cell, there's some mechanism for inhibiting host protein synthesis so that the virus mRNAs can be translated at maximal efficiency. <laughs>